we're going to welcome you to our Experience Matters uh, panel. We're, ex we're very excited about uh, the group that we have today. We have with us, uh, Crystal is supposed to be in the first seat. Crystal Bartlett. Unless, unless that is Crystal, I shouldn't assume anything uh, these days. Um, okay. And then we have Anthony Palandro, uh, Jonathan Bergio. And uh, Greg Falco was going to be with us, but unfortunately his daughter uh, uh, was ill, actually had to go to the hospital, uh, so Greg couldn't be with us, and, uh, but Jonathan Bowden was uh, uh, gracious enough to fill in for us, and we're excited about that. I'm going to, uh, here's how it's going to work. We have questions that we're going to be asking them. Uh, the, the question will go to the person, oh, they're, the only one, they're the only ones who knew the question beforehand, and they're going to have four minutes to respond to that question. And then the other panel members will have two minutes uh, to talk about that same question. They can respond to what the other person was saying. Uh, they're going to be timed. You'll see a timer. Uh, there'll be a little bell that'll go off. Because, you know, bringing preachers up here and giving them uh, a, a certain amount of time, they could easily go over. But at the bell, they're going to stop and so that we can move on. So that's how it's going to work. We're going to start out. They're going to give us a little bit of a background on who they are and uh, what they've done before we go to the first question. So Crystal, tell us about yourself. Hi, guys. I'm Crystal Bartlett. Um, I serve at Elam Fellowship as the short-term missions coordinator um, for our GO team. So I plan short-term missions um, for young adults, college students, and high schoolers. Um, and then I work here at Elam Gospel Church as the children's pastor. Um, I've been serving in ministry since... Uh, I left college, which was only like four or five years ago. I'm just kidding. I um, actually don't know when I graduated. But yeah, that's who I am. I live here in Lima, New York. Um, I love the nations. I've been able to serve with Campus Target um, and other organizations overseas. And so I'm just very grateful to be here today with you guys. You know what? I made a, I, I, I made a mistake. On my sheet of paper here, it's got two lists of people. Uh, you know, I, and actually, on, when we go to the questions, it has Anthony in the first seat. So, yeah, um, yeah. I think he's doing this on purpose. You are over two here, Joe. <laughs> over two. No, uh, let's blame it on the administrator. Okay. Stop. All right. I'm sorry. So, Anthony, give All us right. a little we bit about Joe? yourself. So, my name is Anthony Palandro. I pastor um, New Covenant Community Church, soon to be Freedom Hope Church in New Jersey. We're just over the bridge from Philadelphia. Um, yeah, we're Jersey. I say water. Don't judge me, but spell it water. Okay, I got some other people. Um, and I'm currently an online student here at Elam uh, Bible College, so awesome. that's exciting. Uh, I'm just excited to be up here. Beautiful. I'm Jonathan Bergio. I uh, actually was a missionary for seven years with Basic College Ministries. So I was a missionary, and then I left being a missionary to come back uh, to the church I grew up in, and I just took over from my dad about four and a half years ago. So I grew up going, my, they actually, my parents took the church over when my mom was pregnant with me, and now I just took the church over from my dad four and a half years ago. So it's kind of cool to be in the city I grew up in, the city I love, the church I grew up in, and pastoring that church. Jonathan Bowden, and I uh, have wonderful wife, Danny, and four children, Isaiah, Anna, Grace, and Michaela, and almost number five. <laughs> so we serve over in Niger, West Africa, with Elam Fellowship Missionaries, and just really thrilled about all that God is doing, and I just want to see a new generation raised up uh, to really get engaged in ministry around the world. Awesome. Well, here's our first question for, oh, is Anthony? Wait, uh, no. Um, our first question, Anthony, is uh, how does your greatest insecurity affect your leadership today? My greatest insecurity. So this is a loaded question because I've been a lead pastor for about five minutes. So I have lots of insecurities about what I'm doing. Uh, but I want to talk about just something that I've dealt with. So I, I'm pastoring a church that has just... Um, a history of really solid uh, Elam pastors that have just done an incredible job. Uh, I'm probably the youngest and least experienced one out of all of them, and I'm, so I'm stepping in. So something I really battled with uh, was worrying about what people were thinking of me or how I was doing. I was, you know, worrying about am I preaching good, am I doing good? And uh, what happens is, is I began to shift where my focus wasn't on God, and I wanted to start to please people, uh, you know, and I wanted to. Um, 
make sure that they knew I was doing a good job. So how it affects your ministry um, is that I start to stretch myself. I start to say yes to everything because it's not about God at this point. Now I want the people to be happy with the pastor that I am. So, yeah, so it's just it's challenging. Um, so I want to please people, and I start to do everything. The, what happens with that is what you get is a burnout pastor. I'm 42 years old. I don't need to be burnt out now. i got a long time to go. But God is so faithful, and he's, he's just so good. And I, really at this conference, he's been just reconfirming um, uh, to me what the calling is on my life uh, for such a time as this. And just reminding me that people didn't put me where I'm at. God called me to where I'm at. And he's got a plan and a purpose for this season for that church in New Jersey. And I think when you can, when you can focus back and be centered in Christ, like we've been talking about here, and be rooted in him, uh, it, it makes it much easier to step into your ministry when you're not focused. Obviously, we love the people. I pray for the people, but I can't be worried about pleasing them. I got to do what God has called me to do, and he'll open the doors in, in the ministry when I can do that. Awesome. Excellent. You still got two minutes. I don't need all four minutes. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, well, let's have, we'll have our uh, two-minute our two minute responses. So, Crystal, uh, would you like to talk about that also? Would you like to read the question again? Cause sure, if, that, if you'd like, I can do that. Uh, how does your greatest insecurity affect your leadership today? Ooh, this is such a good question. Um, well, my greatest insecurity is a couple of things. I feel like I'm so insecure about so many things, and I'm constantly just sitting it at the feet of Jesus. Um, but my biggest one that I struggle with constantly being in an Elam community, I didn't go to Elam Bible College, but I didn't go to any Bible college. Like, I grew up in northern Michigan. We're right by the Bible Belt there with every sort of type of college for, I mean, I didn't choose that. I chose a, a university um, within Michigan, and I was, like, always doubting my ability to know the word of God. I felt like that very early on when I first started in um, summer camp ministry, I was like, man, everybody around me is like going to Calvary College or they're going to blah, 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 or they're going to Elam Bible College. And I felt like, man, I can't want, like I won't ever measure up to what these people have because they have this past, they had parents that were pastors. Like I grew up in the foster care system. None of my seven foster homes had people that were pastors. Barely any of them believed in Jesus. Um, may I, I might beg to say that my last foster home before I got adopted, they like did not want me to do ministry so badly that they're like, you will have to leave if this is what you choose to do. And so like for me to think that I could be confident in preaching and teaching, I had to completely submit that to Jesus. It gave me a hunger for his word, a hunger for my, for me to know that I don't need to know the plan because I have the purpose that God has given me. And so I feel totally released from that now. Every now and then the devil likes to creep on in and tell me, yo, you're not qualified to teach on X, Y, and Z. You haven't studied the word long. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm my father's child. He is the one that gives. And I am the one that releases from the giving that he gives me. Got some fire there. John? Tough one to follow. Would you like me to read it again? Or, uh... <laughs> is insecurity the same as weakness? Are we... Well, that's a good question, John, oh, okay. but that's for another panel discussion. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I didn't have time to text my wife to it ask my be, greatest insecurity. So in, my... You could be insecure about your weakness. Yeah, yeah, it's true, yeah. yeah. I'm insecure about a lot of things, you know. Um, I'm, just, I'm glad this chair is secure. could hold me up. Um, <laughs> I'm ready to catch you. Yeah, thank you. That would be awesome. <laughs> I'd say uh, one of, for me, it's, I wish I had more time to think about it, but um, one of them is I'm, I really have this vision to be successful in ministry, and oftentimes it's the same thing that's distracting me for why I do ministry, and it gets very confusing because uh, we want to grow our church, we want to reach more people for Jesus, but a lot of times, you know that phrase, I'm a human being, not a human doing, mm -hmm. and I can find myself doing and doing and doing and getting uh, away from the very reason I do what I do is to serve who Jesus is, not to for the outcome that I get when after I serve him, if that makes sense. So I think a lot of that is um, learning that balance between 
uh, success in loving people, uh, growing the church, and loving individuals, and that balance of, um, you know, we want to reach people, we want to see people come to Christ, but we don't want to neglect people. We don't, at the, at the cost to uh, maybe get a couple more people through the door, are we going to neglect somebody in need, or not do something because we're so obsessed with growing or comparing, and and so that's probably one of the greatest ways. I'm just trying to find that line and balance of truly ministering to God, but also being a good steward on what we're entrusted with to grow the ministry he's given us in the geographic area he's placed us in. And so it's really a, a, a good balance that I try to, try to. well, it's, it's tough to find a good balance to try to do that. Excellent. Thank you, John. That's great. And Jonathan. That's... Wow. That's awesome. All those things, I resonate with that, and I have all these different, I was like, which insecurity should I share? <laughs> which one is the greatest one? <laughs> and uh, to just try to be brief within a couple of minutes, for me, personally, when I was really young, there was an insecurity that happened, and uh, it, it was related to speech. When I was young, I had kind of a, a little bit of a speech impediment, and I would get laughed at, and kids would make fun of me, and and all this kind of, you know, I went, I had to take, take some therapy and this and that. When I was like five, six, seven years old, so, you know, that was always kind of a, like an insecurity weakness for me. And then as I got older, I felt God calling me into full-time ministry and teaching and preaching and going to Elam Bible Institute. And I remember Carlton Spencer walking up near the pond. I'm just a no one from Maine, you know, I'm just my first year at Elam. He just comes up to me, wraps his arms around me, says, no, you have a family, you have a place. God has a call for your life. And whatever God puts in your heart, you know, he will fulfill it. It's not about you, it's about his grace. His grace is sufficient in our weakness. And, uh, you know, fast forward that to going over to Niger, West Africa, where we live, we had to learn a language. And that was probably my greatest insecurity when I went over to the mission field was learning a language because of just that, you know, growing up experiences, things like that. But by God's grace and by wonderful Nigerian brothers in Christ who just sat with me, were patient with me, teaching me how to share different things in the language. You know, I caught it pretty quickly by the grace of God. And, and now I'm just even like the last couple of days, I've been doing WhatsApp with friends in Nigeria and the house of language and things like that. And I just, I look back and I'm just like, what a testimony of God's grace being sufficient in our weakness. And that's just all the insecurities and weaknesses that I've had in my life. I can look back to the, what, the time when I just surrender it. And when I surrender it, then his grace is poured out. When his grace is poured out, then he can work his will. And then afterwards, he can't take the credit. It's like, it's all his for the glory of Jesus. Yeah, that's so good. Excellent, excellent. Um, can I tell that story? It reminded me of a story. My son, when he was, I think, in like second grade, uh, they they were picking up on a speech problem with him uh, on certain words, and uh, they sent him into they sent him into speech therapy, and uh, and I was working with them throughout it, and then we we had a meeting with the speech therapist, and uh, I started. My Joanne was talking first, and then I st I started talking, and she was like, wait 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 wait, this the therapist. <laughs> And uh, she said, you're, you're working with them? And I, I, then I even had a more thick New York accent. She said, she said you're the problem. You're, you're the problem. Please stop working with them. Because uh, he was speaking with a New York accent. That was the only, that was, the, that was really the problem. So uh, and Josh, would, like, never forgives me for making, because he was you know, going to speech therapy and stuff. And he, he was getting, uh, you know, made fun of at times. Uh, but, yeah, that's my speech therapy uh, story as a father. So, okay, uh, question number two, Crystal. Um, how are you leaning into the older generation to take you into the future? When I saw this question, I thought this is the most loaded gun that you could ever give yeah, me. be nice. Because I, I am so blessed that all of you are here. I believe that this panel before us that was full of seasoned saints, I'm like, I just want to sit at your feet and draw from the well and just drink up what, what y'all were saying. Um, Neil, you said, I have sown where I, I mean, I have reaped where I have not sown earlier. And I thought that is a testament mm -hmm. of sitting and being mentored and knowing what has gone before you so that you can prepare the ground for what will come after you. Amen. And, um, that was my, that was my uh, story kind of when we went to Sealand. Uh, when I was living over in Asia, we arrived on our college campus 
And we thought, holy smokes, we must be really good at sharing the gospel. I was like, there's no way. It's our first day here. I can barely say anything in Mandarin. But we saw 14 people saved in our first day there. It wasn't because of anything that we did, but everything that God and those that had gone before us did. And I, and I just feel like I need to lean into the older, how I've been leaning into the older generation is um, I don't just want them to tell me that I'm really good at stuff. I don't need that. I need y'all to tell me what we have been really bad at and how we can grow. I need you to show me how you did things and, and your mistakes. And I feel like the greatest um, moments of weakness for me or where I've made the biggest mistakes was when I didn't have a mentor that was from the older generation. It was when I didn't have any guidance of what had gone before me. It was, it was when the stories had been lost and all of the land had been dried up. I look at Exodus 18, um, verse 17. It's where we learn about Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law. And he was so diligent to go to him and say, um, he said, you are not doing it right. <laughs> you and the people who have come to you will get too tired this is too much work for you and you cannot do it all by yourself. Now listen to me. I will give you advice and want you to be and want God to be with you. I think that that is so powerful. There's other things that happen in that as you know the scripture. It, he went on to tell him how to be more successful, but he spoke from a place of love. And so I lean a lot on the older generation to love me. To, to give me mentorship. I love Pastor Greg. I love working here at Elam Life Church because I'm under such great leadership. I'm under, and with Alex and Jody, like they are pouring out on me in abundance. I'm learning from stories. But one thing that I love to do is ask them, guys, how can I grow? Can you tell me stories of when you first went to this land? Can you tell me things that the people needed that, that you brought with you? And so um, young people, in this room. I know I'm 26, so um, I'm getting up there. I met a, I met a couple. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but I, young people, look at the older generation and don't think they're always just pounding at the door to tell you what to do. But listen, some of the things I put on the shelf, because they don't know me, they don't have a relationship with me. But a lot of the things I listen to, because you have something greater, greater, because I've not gone through it. I want to learn from how you've lived. But at the same time, I've lived a lot of life myself that many of you haven't. And so I love, as I learn to share what, what I've experienced and to better learn how to use those experiences. And so I just, I'm so thankful for our older generation. I'm so thankful for um, the generation that I'm in and the moment that we're in and how we are moving more towards God. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, Anthony, uh, we're going to react to that, uh, respond to I that question. To the, yeah, next generation. So um, I have, in my life, and when I gave my heart to the Lord, pretty much since I've given my heart to the Lord, I've always made sure that I've positioned myself under the next generation. I want to be a sponge for the next generation. Like, I'm asking questions. I'm listening to everything they say. I want to be where they're at. Uh, it's so important to lean on the next generation. And even now, in the situation I'm at now uh, at our church, so we did a foundations class, right? And the first thing was the history of the church. And I was going to talk about the history of the church. And I could read it from the website, and I could talk about the history of the church, but I thought it'd be so much better to go find the very first pastor of the church. So we know Pastor John McGall. Some of you guys know him from Elam Fellowship. And he came out, and I asked him questions, and he shared about the history of the church. And I was just so educated and also so encouraged to just to know the roots, the history of the church so that I can... Um, walk in that history, walk in that blessing, walk in where those seeds were sown uh, by the previous pastors. And I was under Pastor John Young for two years before I became the lead pastor. So it's just positioning myself under them and just and feeding on everything that they have uh, and just being a sponge for it. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, for me, uh, so I took over at the church for my dad about four and a half years ago. My mom and dad still work there. My dad's still full time. And one thing I feel like that's working really well for us is we're leaning into each other's strengths. And so um, it's okay, like my dad, he has strength in amazing areas and, and I lean into him on all that stuff. In fact, like he's more valuable 
now than I feel ever uh, because of letting him lead in his strengths and he lets me lead in my strengths and we obviously still work together and everything but uh, because of that it's just it's super helpful that I don't feel that I have to know everything or be all to everyone I could actually focus on like what God's called me to specifically and my skill set for example he does almost all of our pastoral care he's like the best pastoral care pastor you could ask for and it takes so much off of my plate uh, and actually enables me to, to be honest, to go home with my family at night and to hang out with my kids. And so just for me, I would say like how I lean into it is like letting each other do their own strengths. Like, you know, he's good at one area, I'm not, just let him do it. You know, like what's, why do I gotta put a limit on it? Why do I have to try to hold him back? And same thing with me. And I think we just worked a really good, I feel like a lot of our chemistry has come to where we lean into each other's strengths. And uh, it's been a huge blessing to me to do that. And uh, yeah. Excellent. One thing that has really helped us over the years has been being held accountable and submitting to recognizing a spiritual authority wherever we are. And I remember back in the Elam days that they said, you know, you should always have someone mentoring you, speaking into your life. And you should also be looking at mentoring and speaking to someone else's life. So be, being a disciple to Jesus but also knowing your place in the body of Christ with the spiritual authority. So uh, in the States and in Niger, I have, uh, our family has different ones who I've told them, you know, spiritual fathers and mothers, we've said to them, my wife and I, uh, please let us know if we ever say or do anything that isn't uh, Christ honoring, or, you know, we know that sometimes the heart can be deceitful above all things, like to speak into our life. And, and that has been a real strength to us because sometimes we don't see the, the things that we say or the things that we do. And, you know, you need a, that older generation, they have the perspective, they have an experience that um, when you're close to them, they speak into your life, it really saves a lot of the, the pitfalls you can fall into. And so, um, so I just remember, uh, just so quickly, one quick example in Niger, one of the Nigerian pastors um, that we'd mentioned this to, and he, one time he was like, yeah, Jonathan, when we go to this event, make sure you take off your shoes whenever there's carpet. And, you know, before that, I had actually stepped on a, a mat with my shoes on, and I guess it was really offensive in the culture. So as soon as he told that to me, I took off my shoes, and it just resolved the issue just like that. And all of a sudden, the event that we went to, it really helped bring ministry and healing. It wasn't like they were looking at what I had done wrong, but it was like all of a sudden, the, the, it was back on the Lord. And I just feel like over my life, we've had mentors in the faith from Elam, uh, my father-in-law, uh, over in Niger with the childs, and so many others. Uh, we work with Nigerian colleagues as well, and all of them have just poured into us. And when they do that, it helps us just jump ahead and then also help to better disciple the next generation coming after us. Be like, this is what we heard, this is what we learned, and now here it is for you. Go for it. Awesome. Good job. Excellent. Some really good responses there. Okay, uh, we're up to Jonathan. Um, Let's see, Jonathan. I want to give you one I can stump you on. Uh, no, how, Jonathan, how do you walk with somebody when they are questioning or deconstructing their faith? Thanks for the softball one, man. Yeah. <laughs> you, might need, you may need to define deconstructing your faith, too, before. I don't know if everybody knows. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, questioning, I think uh, some deconstructing means that, like, you know, deconstructing or taking apart. But I think what has happened in my generation and the next one is, is culture is very strong at convincing people on what they think is true. And so, like, even if it goes against something that's clear in the Bible, uh, culture will be like, well, I could be a Christian and still do this, right? I could be a Christian and still believe this. And so it's difficult for people to say, well, how could I serve a God who loves us um, if, uh, you know, he doesn't love people who are gay or people who are this. And, and they kind of like put you in a corner and, and they deconstruct faith uh, because of a belief or something they want to believe or they don't want to change or something they're struggling with. I think that's kind of what it means. So that wasn't part of my four minutes. So that was, that was no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't care. So, man, how do you walk with somebody who's deconstructing their faith? Um, well, um, I think part of the answer, oh, there you go. There you said it. Part of the answer is, um, is right in the question, you walk with somebody. Um, and for me, I'll just go to a deeper issue that I have that I kind of talked about earlier, is what if we served God not for an outcome, but we served God to serve God? Yeah. Come on, come on. What if I served God, and this is what I'm dealing with personally, I'm not saying you are, or the church, I'm saying me personally, what if I served God not to build a huge church? 
not to get a big budget or to see thousands come to Christ or to uh, create a bigger ministry? What if I actually just served God in the place I am, in the capacity I have to just serve God? And I wasn't worried about the results. And so this is something I'm thinking about myself. And then there's something I always say in my church, and I say it all the time. I, I have personal conversations with people, is we serve, Jesus saves. Yeah. So I, actually, I'm going to tell you something. You might not know this, but do you know you've actually never saved anybody your whole life? Right. Unless you were on the cross, you died, and you rose again, you haven't saved anyone. Right. And what I'm trying to do is take the pressure off of us because when we have this pressure for outcome, we all of a sudden change how we minister. Yeah. Because if our ministry is dependent upon an outcome, then we have to minister in a certain way to get that outcome to come. Yeah. And we could step on people yeah. who've already been hurt by the faith. Now think about it. Somebody who's deconstructing your faith, let's just be honest, what, nine out of ten times they were hurt by the church, yeah. right? So now you're, you're ministering for an outcome to convert them, to get them to believe what you believe. And they're operating out of a hurt. I mean, if you go to counseling and read books on how to help people out of hurt, you don't just force them, suck it up, you know, forget about it, it's over, God loves you. You don't just give them another scripture verse and smack it on their head and tell them to get over it, you know. You can't cast the demon out of them. But if we change how we minister, and this is for me, this is how I'm doing it. I'm not convicting anyone, I'm convicting myself. If I stop ministering for my outcome, and I just minister for what Jesus has called me to do, to love him and to serve him, then I'm better equipped to walk with somebody who's dealing with some really difficult issues. Come on. Right? I don't have, it's not on me to convince them to believe everything. It's not on me to get them to say a prayer or to get them to change their life. It's on me to serve them and then the person, the God who died on the cross, who rose from the grave, it's on him to do the saving work. And so I feel in my life, how do I work with someone who's deconstructing their faith? I think my motives are the most important thing. What are my motives? Are my motives to say, get up on stage and be like, well, we had 10 people get saved. We had 10 people who were addicted. We had 10 people living this lifestyle. We had two people doing this. And there, or is it to actually just love the people who are made in the image of God, who are equally loved by God as much as I am, even though they have some pretty messed up issues? Mind you, you have some pretty messed up issues too. They're just not the hot topic right now that we're dealing with. And so for me, I just walk with them. Yes. Literally, I listen to them. And I got to be honest, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, just a little over. I, I listen to them. There's some, uh, something happened the other day, and me and my dad were talking. And someone was saying some pretty crazy things about the church. And me and my dad looked at each other and was like, honestly, after what they've been through, I can't blame them. Because their hurt is valid. The thing that happened is valid, even though their current belief is not theologically sound, there's a current hurt that's affecting it. And so how do I walk with someone? I walk with them. I love them. I check my motives. I don't try to get them to be a problem to solve, a person to love, and I, I don't worry about the outcome. I just, I just love them the best I can. All right, that's a drop the mic moment. We're done. <laughs> Give me an extra donut. We should talk about, I think we need to talk about offense now because John just told us we all have issues. And uh, I don't know, I don't know. That, that we'd really get into a mess if we started talking about those issues. But okay, Anthony? Um, can I start over because I have new insecurities now? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, I just love what he was saying, what you just walk uh, with people. So I'm going to relate to, you know, I was a youth pastor for years before I became a lead pastor. Um, but you know, dealing with kids, I've seen this in the youth where they deconstruct or question their faith and they're coming from broken homes or hurting homes and sometimes when they sit with me or they talk to me, it's almost as if they're expecting me to just yell at them or to say, what do you mean you question your faith? Like, how, what do you, how could you not believe in God? Uh, so I think it's a relief when, when it's like if Jonathan was saying, it's just, I just walk with them and remind them that, that God loves them and, and who they are in Christ. And the Bible says that they're a masterpiece 
So this is the same God that breathed stars from his mouth that created the heavens and the earth, but he calls them a masterpiece. And when I just affirm that over them and speak that over their lives, and we're not condemning them, and we're just walking alongside and loving them, uh, uh, you know, I've seen really good fruit from that of, of them really just wanting to fall in love with Jesus. So I, I, just, I just think that's what he was saying, walking alongside of them, just reminding them who they are in Christ and that, that God has a plan and a purpose for their life. So so good can i have anthony's extra 50 seconds i'm just kidding um no i love what y'all are saying i feel like we're making like step one step two step three okay but for me i feel like some of y'all might be a lot like me where i'm just like y'all need to grind harder like what's wrong with you you are deconstruct like i am totally that person that's like you're deconstructing your faith because someone spilled your cereal it's never that simple and so like it's really not but like in my head I'm like we have lived through so much I come I immediately go to comparison I'm like I've lived through this I, and I haven't torn apart my faith and I'm like whoa crystal how selfish Jesus would never say that to his children he would never compare in that way he would meet he would crawl onto the floor exactly where they're at and he would cry with them in the in the definition of deconstruction it says this it says um um breaking down or analyzing something especially the words in a work of nonfiction or fiction to discover its true significance this generation's looking for truth I see, I see two things. I see hurting people seeking truth. Many have gotten the money. Many have gotten the title. Many have gotten the things that they thought were supposed to be the truth, the thing. They know the word. But how do they know it's true? So I want to I wanna crawl on the floor and cry with them, and then I want to show them how true these words are. It's, there's a time for calling people out. People are like, I don't trust man. I'm like, are you kidding me? I just saw you eat a burger from McDonald's, and we know Johnny didn't wash his hands. I need everybody to stop telling me you don't trust man when you out, you're eating at fast food joints, you're driving cars from dealerships that are falling apart. You trust man. You, you, you don't know if you trust God. Amen. So I just, I encourage us to break off comparison in the name of Jesus, crawl on the floor and cry with them, meet them where they're at. Jonathan. Wow. That is all awesome. <laughs> yeah. You're in a tough spot. <laughs> I am. <laughs> well, I'll share a, so a story about my son. He's helped me with this. Um, because cross-cultural ministry is a little bit different, but in some ways it's the same thing. Uh, we deal with a lot of uh, more fundamental religious type spirit when we're reaching out, trying to break the boundaries between faith, sharing our faith, evangelism. So my son's a really good example, Isaiah, or they call me, uh, they call him in Niger, they call me Ishaya. So um, he's had a heart for his friends for years. And outside of our home, he plays soccer all the time with all of his friends. And many times they'll get into this little bit of an argument. Not an argument on his side, but like they'll argue with him saying, why are you a Christian? And you know, why are you a missionary? And why did you come to Niger? And like, what do you believe? And they'll start, he'll start telling them. Uh, he'll be like, well, you know, we love Jesus. And we came here just to share about his love. And he's the Savior. And he's the Lord. And they'll be like, well, we have to save ourselves. You know, in our faith in Islam, we have to try to do good works. And, and Isaiah will be like, no. It's, so they'll start some of those discussions. But about last year, uh, Isaiah came to me. He's like, we really want to have a team. We want to start like a little football uh, team. And, or they call it football, but it's soccer. And uh, we need a coach. You know, so I was like, well, okay. I'll, 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 I'll just be present, be the coach, you know, that you guys play soccer. And, and as we began to hang out with the youth all around our neighborhood, all of a sudden, some of those walls and the barriers came down. And these are from some very strict, fundamental Islamic homes, uh, pretty serious. And um, all of a sudden, Isaiah is like sharing the gospel with them. They're coming in, we're sitting, we're drinking together, eating together, we're just we're praying with each other. At the end of each soccer match or each practice, we'd be praying with them. At first, of course, they're all treating it like this is not a big deal. They're, they're, they're joking around each other, laughing. Oh, he's, he's praying. And at the end of the six months, they were asking, one time I forgot to pray at the end of our uh, time, and, and they're all asking us, or Isaiah, to pray. 
for them. Like, Please pray with us. And they came with us. They came with Isaiah to the Christmas service in the church and they're meeting other Christian friends. So I just feel like a lot of it is what they've all been saying. It's personal, spending time with people, yeah. making it real. And once they know you, the barriers come down, the bars come down, and then they can receive the truth of the gospel. Excellent. Wow. Good stuff. Really good. Okay, Jonathan, uh, this one's for you. Uh, how are you, uh, like, meeting the challenges uh, in, the, in, your, in the area of your ministry, in the area of leadership? How are you meeting leadership challenges? Yeah, uh, I think one of the things that's really we've learned a lot, especially from the team that we're working with, is that uh, leader, there's always leadership challenges wherever you go. If you're a part of it, there's going to be a challenge of some because <laughs> we all have issues. You know, I mean, I learned from early, you know, early on, it's like I'm going to offend someone even if I don't want to, and they're going to offend me at some point. So when you work with a team, when you work in leadership, um, they're going to have some offenses that come up, but it's really important to have a culture of honor, to have a, a value of honoring leaders and honoring the body of Christ and honoring someone just based on their value in the kingdom of God. And when you have that honoring culture in a team, and again, the team that we're working with over in Niger, there's a great honor in the society, in the Christian realm of just honoring those who've gone before us and uh, honoring uh, just the legacy and the heritage and wanting to pass it on. And it's the same thing I see in, in Elam Fellowship and Elam Bible Institute is just honoring and then passing it on. So um, a lot of times with challenges in leadership, it's been helpful when I'm in a team that is an honor culture. And when there's an honor culture, it's easier to deal with offenses because offenses will come. <laughs> and um, you have to be willing to honor even in an offense. Uh, practically speaking, there's times in ministry we probably have all faced this when you'll just be going in to do your, your, your regular thing. Like I'm at the Bible school and I go into the Bible school. Sometimes I'll be one of my good pastor friends will come. And sometimes there's an issue, a misunderstanding, something that happened. All of a sudden there's a flare up. It's just like the, the arrow from the enemy, you know, the flaming arrow comes in that conversation. All of a sudden they're yelling at me or something like that. I'm like, where did this come from? Like, what, what happened? And then um, afterwards I'll, be, I'll just be sitting there and be like, what just happened? And then I'll be like, I could get really offended right now. <laughs> but then it's all of a, I go back and I'm like, what did I say? And, and one time I remember this happened. I went back and they said, oh, a couple of days ago you said something or, you know, you didn't greet us the way that we usually do. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry because in our culture you have to honor people by greeting them and, and how is your family? How is this? And one day I was so busy with everything going on I just kind of went to the Bible school. I didn't, hadn't greeted them properly. hadn't asked about their family and how they're doing and they just kind of exploded. Not because, because they loved me so much. They felt like I... They, I mattered to them. They felt like I wasn't respecting them. So it, it was really an easy situation to resolve. I was like, I'm sorry for not greeting you because I know culturally it's so important in Niger. So I'm sorry for not doing that. And he was immediately, my pastor friend was like, and I'm sorry for getting angry. I shouldn't have done that. And I have a lot of pressure at home and marriage and this and that. And I was like, oh, let's just pray together. So we prayed together. And all of a sudden, it was resolved. And there's just, so, and there's been times I've been on the end of that. I've gotten a little bit frustrated or something, and I've caused hurt, and then I have to go to someone and be willing to say, look, this is what I did. I'm sorry I said this in the way I said it, and, and I, you know, I honor you, and please pray for me. Please forgive me. So one of the ch challenges of uh, in leadership is, uh, to a solution, is working as a team. It has to be a team in leadership, and with a team, yes. you have to be ready to be transparent. You have to be open. You have to honor those on the team, even when you are offended, even when you're hurt, even when somebody just feels rips your heart out after you've invested in them or something. You have to just keep honoring them, keep uh, investing in them, and be transparent. Speak the truth in love. Cover in agape love. Speak with them one-on-one. -on -one. Don't tell all these other people about it. Just speak to them. Resolve it. Pray. They pray for you. I remember, I, uh, again, I had offended this brother, and he was like, let's pray for each other. I prayed for him. At the end, he prayed for me. And uh, it was just like the bond that I have with my brother now is stronger than it was before the offense, before the thing. So I just want to encourage you. Like a lot of times there's conflict management or in leadership. There's all these different conflicts, whether it's in the leadership team or if it's in the church environment or the Bible school students. There's always going to be issues. But when there's a value honoring culture, when we're respecting people, when we're really ready to be able to say, oh, yes, I did uh, say or do something I hurt you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me and listen to them, and then agree with them, pray for each other. It, actually, it forms a bond that's even stronger. And the enemy's like, oh, I sent an arrow. I tried to bring division. I tried to bring a separation, and it was just squashed out in the name of Jesus. And the enemy's defeated, and Jesus' name is glorified. So.
So we're talking about challenges, how you're facing the challenges in leadership. How, how do I face challenges in leadership? Um, hopefully I face them well, <laughs> patiently. But uh, um, one, one way for me is, uh, first of all, you nail it right in the head. Uh, honor is if it's yeah. with another person, like you can't overcome a challenge if you don't honor people. Um, and so uh, that, that, that's definitely it. And the other thing I would say for me is – uh, a combination of, you know, prayer, the Holy Spirit leading, um, collaboration from people. But I found, for me personally, is is actually just taking the time to let to think about the conflict you're having. I feel like we could get, you know, at least for me, uh, you know, I go to work, I gotta get my message done by Sunday, I gotta go home, put the kids to bed, I gotta go to this, I gotta go here, and then I don't have time. I'm like, oh, we got this problem. Why isn't it fixed yet? And I found, for me, there are times when I'm the only one in the office and I could just write on my dry erase board. I could just think about it. I could just let something kind of marinate. And a lot of times, uh, I, I actually believe it's the Holy Spirit working in me. Uh, and there's this kind of combination of slowing down when there's a conflict, uh, thinking it through, uh, and taking your time. And for me, when there's a tons of conflict, um, you know, I usually, honestly, like, you know, I used to do on Facebook posts, I would write out my post and then I would just delete it uh, because, like, there's no need for my response. You know, I write out my email and then I delete it. Make sure your computer's d uh, not connected to the internet in case there's an actual send. And I found what's really interesting is a lot of conflicts are resolved when I don't have that first response when I don't give my initial reaction and I have time just to let it think about, see where they're coming from, honor them, um, and then just even other conflicts like problems with COVID and, and all this stuff, I've actually found when I've had time to think about it, uh, we have a way better solution uh, to that. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks. You are brave for ever typing an email <laughs> and then, or Facebook post, and then knowing that you deleted it, oh, it's dangerous. It is dangerous. It's so therapy. Can you say the question again? I'm so sorry, Joe. Uh, it's, how are you uh, dealing with the challenges in the area of leadership? Yes. Um, leading is really hard. Um, really hard. Words are really hard. Communicating. Like body language, all the things. Um, I, Jonathan and Joe, nope, your name's not, you're also Jonathan and Jonathan, <laughs> just gonna call you different names, couldn't get easier. <laughs> Two Jonathans, um, you both, you both do, I mean, you both said things that I love to do frequently. I love thinking, how can I celebrate this person constantly? If I'm praying for people constantly and I'm celebrating them, there's like literally no grievance in my spirit usually with them. Um, and I'm usually like, Lord, help me, because it's probably me and not them. Let's be honest, like I, my heart, I wanna say I'm so unoffendable, but that's not true because I'm human and I'm flesh. And so first I evaluate myself and then I see, oh actually this is really is a problem or a growth area that I need to draw on this person. Let me choose a situation where they feel honored to have this conversation. Um, I've right off the cusp before, the first time I see someone, I know that they've dropped the ball on something. I'm like, hey, you were supposed to give me this now, can you do this now? Cause like I'm like in my head, I'm like, we gotta go. We got 24 hours in a day, part of that sleep, part of that's me getting my boy off the bus and eating and spending time with him. So like we actually only have 30 seconds to spend time together and get our job done. Um, when in reality, they matter. So whatever project I'm working on will never matter more than the people I'm doing it with. And so realizing I need to be praying for them constantly. I need to be seeking opportunities to celebrate them and not just celebrate them with um, the way that I would want to be celebrated, um, looking at how they would choose to be celebrated. If you haven't done the five-fold ministry test or the, the love languages test with them, do it. Invest in your leaders. It's worth it um, to know how they receive love and better how to, um, to, to even walk through hard situations with them. Sometimes in love, we just have to call them out. Um, but often if we start with prayer and we look at, look at the situation through our um, through maybe how we had our part in that, we can resolve it. Excellent. That's good. I usually resolve it via text message. <laughs> 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 Don't 
don't do that. That's not <laughs> Uh, but they just hit it, you know, on the head. Just love, respect, honor, trust is so key in, in leadership. When you can trust one another, you know, sometimes in elders meetings, you don't have a chance to process everything. You need to respond. But, you know, these are, these are your brothers. These are your sisters. There's trust that's been established. But the thing is, um, being a lead pastor is understanding or being leaders that other leaders also have a vision from God. God has also spoken things to them. They have a word. They have things they want to share. They have a vision that they want to cast. So it's being a listener. It's praying for them, uh, coming alongside them. Uh, and yeah, and that's it. Just really trusting them, loving them, honoring them, and, and listening to what also God has put on their heart so that we can walk through it together. It's not a one-man show, um, and sometimes that happens in, in church leadership, but we want to be a team, and you want to establish a team of people that, are old, that walk alongside you, that are in your corner and on your team. Excellent. Wow. You guys are doing great. We're actually out of the original questions, but I wanted to, uh, if we can give them two minutes each. Um, you know, we just heard a powerful message about uh, kind of pass, you know, passing up, passing it on and raising up the next generation. And we talked a little bit about, uh, you, know, you know, leaning into the older generation. I think uh, a lot of us, or at least I know, it can be intimidating to... Uh, try to reach the younger generation and it and sometimes it's like clueless on how you interact with the younger generation um, you know two minutes if you could what advice would you give some of us older people on being able to connect in a very real way to be able to raise up uh, some of the younger people that are in our lives or maybe we don't even have those how do we how do we do it though what would advice would you give us to be able to raise up the, the younger generation and we'll start with Andy. You got two minutes each. Believe in them. Uh, believe in the next generation. Uh, know that they have, um, God has a plan and a purpose for their lives, that they've called them for such a time as this. Uh, it's a now generation, um, and, and they're ready to go. So I would just say walk alongside them, but the biggest thing, just show them that you believe in them, that you trust them, get them involved in ministry, get them serving in your churches. Uh, you know, we have, we have young 17, 18-year-old kids on our worship team, uh, leading worship, praying for people. So just believe, get them connected, get them involved, and let them know that, that you know you want to see God work in their lives and move in their lives. And uh, yeah, just pray with them, love them. So leave it. Leave it. Yeah. That's Excellent. so good. That is so good, Aunt. Um, we this Sunday here at Elam Life Church, we are doing Youth Sunday. The the kids have known about Youth Sunday for the last month. And they have asked our youth pastor here, John Chapel, multiple times, like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And we've been preparing them slowly behind the scenes. Prepare them without even telling them. Like, we've been inviting them in youth group to come up and do announcements and do communion and do offering. We've been preparing them in, in so many different ways that I believe this Sunday is going to go off without a hitch. Like, yeah, there's going to be bumps in the road, but it's going to be amazing because they're prepared because they've been sewn into. Neil, when he was talking about the arrow, I love hunting. And if an arrow is not smooth and not straight, it will not go far. And so the way that you test your arrow is you go ahead and you start by preparing your arrow. You, you, you put it in the quiver and you see if it, it will hold. And so um, in kids ministry and even in at, uh, Elam Fellowship, something I like to do with my people is I love reading books with them. I hate reading, but I like to do know that somebody else is suffering through it with me. Um, and so you have your buddy there. And so here at um, Elam Life Church, I, we just sent out our EBI student, Danilo, back to Columbia. And while he was here, we got to read three different books um, about church leadership, about how Jesus is enough and how he's all we need in whatever um, ministry we need. I mean, whatever ministry he's sending us into. Um, and we went to Cracker Barrel because he'd never been. And I was like, what's more American? And um, he, he was eating grits for the first time. And he looked up at me and he said, he said, uh, Miss Crystal, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this by myself. And I said, I do, because you have been. Little do you know, you've already ran children's ministry. You've already prepared lessons. You've already done the things because we have prepared you for this time. Prepare them. Don't passively mentor them and take them to coffee and shopping trips. I love those things, Jody. Um, but prepare them with knowledge, with truth, and awesome. give them a firm foundation to continue to walk Excellent. with. So Believe in them. Prepare them. John? 
Uh, so first of all, I actually want to share something funny is um, I still feel like I'm super young. I'm 37. And the other day I had an interaction with some of the kids from our youth group and I walked away feeling insecure. Like, am I dorky? Like, do they not think I'm cool? So I feel the pain a lot more now. Like, it's hard. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. I want them to think I'm cool. I don't know why, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm a dad of three. Like, so I feel the pain. Um, one thing I would say actually is that I've been learning and it's a very common saying, but it's, you project what you are. And so when you try to reach someone who's younger and you feel rejected, Go ahead. Hello. they're feeling rejected. Yes. And, um, my counselor in our church, and I go to counseling with her. I love her. She's great. Uh, I had a problem dealing with someone that they would always get under my nerves. And this is what she told me. She goes, before you react, look at the hurt, and then react while thinking of their hurt. And I want to encourage you, when you try to reach to another generation, just remember, they're projecting what they are. So all that insecurity you feel, it's probably because they only grew up looking at a phone and they don't know how to do eye contact. Yeah. And smacking the phone on the other hand is not going to help. It's going to take time. But also, when there's things that are happening before you react, look at the hurt. Look at these broken families. These kids who have no identity because there was a dad who never told them they were beautiful and they were loved and they're, they're important. Look at the hurt before you react, uh, and I think it's going to take you a long way. And just know, man, we all feel insecure reaching other people we don't know. Whether they're younger, older, a different culture, it, we just that's just the name of the game. It's just that's what happens. Uh, but you could do it. Uh, they're just operating out of a deep sense of hurt. It's stuck on screens all the time, but you could break them out of it. Real good. Real good. Thanks, John. And John? Amen. Wow. Believe in them, trust them, and part into them. Uh, one thing that uh, Neil Childs mentioned this morning is that insecure leaders uh, control. And uh, I just know the younger generation can sense control a mile away. And uh, they really are put off by that because they want the freedom to express who they are. Uh, they want to honor the other, you know, the older generation, but they also want the freedom to bring new ideas, creativity, things like that. And I look back at my life and I've had so many people that gave me that freedom. And, uh, you know, my father-in-law, Pastor Bob, um, we're just young assistant pastor at the church, and he's like, just go for it, preach on Sundays. And he would, he would sit in the pew and watch me like, up front, and after he'd say, good job, you did a great job. And I knew it wasn't like that great, but he, just his affirmation was amazing. I went over to Niger and Ron Childs and, you know, and, and Neil Childs and others are just like, how about you do this and do this? We'll give this opportunity. So I know the younger generation, and now, of course, like you said, we're getting older, but the younger us and those uh, 20 year olds and 30 year olds a lot of them want to be participants they want to be involved they're not content to be just sitting watching it they want to be in doing something and as a older generation leader it's really important to provide opportunities to make room for them to participate to be a part of what's happening and then when they catch the vision then they just go for it we have teams come to Niger they start to get in a love for missions because they're going out and they're doing it and then missions is a part of their life for the rest of their life they just love missions and I'm one of them <laughs> so it's the same thing in the kingdom of God working in the church is give them a taste of it let them have responsibility let them make mistakes give them believe in them enough to let them make mistakes and just go and encourage them afterwards say good job you're doing it I can see God's hand on your life and after that I mean these guys are just going to go for God and there's no turning them back and they'll just be attracted to ministry serving the local church and how many volunteers and everyone will be like I want to volunteer I want to volunteer because they got a taste for what it's like for God to use them in ministry so. awesome excellent hey can we have a hand for our uh, panel I just think they did a great job and uh, wait we got uh, uh, before we end though uh, Paul Johansson wanted to say a few words to us and uh so we're having him come up to do that. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, when you see these kind of things happening, uh, I would like to say that my Elam training is what helped me going forward. Uh, I, I was out in Africa for years, and I felt of the Lord to visit another Bible school 200 miles away that was related to us, but it wasn't an Elam Bible school. 
and I, I took the local bus and went all the way out there, and I got there. They knew I was coming, and when I got there, they was in a little place to sleep in a little house, and they, and they said, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, be over here, we get started. So a little before 8, I started walking over about uh, two or 300 feet away, and I met the young man coming the other way, the other missionary, a young missionary guy coming, and he said to me this, he said, go back, they're on strike today. I said, what? The whole Bible school is on, yep. They're all on strike. They're not, they refuse to go into the, into the classrooms. So I said to him, I didn't come here to waste my time. God sent me here. I said, you turn around, we're going back. And we went back to the Bible school, and the students were sitting, about 70 or 80 of them. Some had rocks and sticks, and they were all sitting there. And I looked at them, and I waved at them, and I said, get all of the staff in this classroom. But we're going to go on our face until they lay those rocks down. Now that's what I learned when you serve God by the Spirit. You don't get angry. You don't yell at them. They're being controlled by a, a spirit. And uh, they, they were very angry. And I, I, I ultimately I got into the, what the reason was. But at that point, they were, they were not willing to move. We went into that room, and I taught on prayer, and then another brother, and then we went on the concrete floor, and we prayed, and the door was open, and all the students were sitting out there. And, what, and, the, and, the, and the, young, the young leader of the school who had never been to Bible school, his Bible school was a Thompson Chain Bible, so he, that, that was it. And he said, no, no, you, let, let's shut the school down. I said, we don't play games with the devil. We have to stay on our knees. So we prayed all morning, and then, uh, and then uh, the students, they said, well, we're not going to give them food. No, let them eat, but we're going to be praying. And we prayed late in the afternoon. One student came to me, and he said, can I talk to you? And he told me what the problem was, the underlying problem. And really, they had a case. They had a case with what they said. They actually had a reason not to strike, but to be very angry. And I, I shared it with the, with the st I came in to the, to the staff and I said, this is what's the underlining problem. And we have to ask forgiveness. We did that. Actually, what they wanted the students to learn something, the student, something about some spiritual thing, and, and, and they put it in, a, in another class to sneak it in. And the students said, hold it. That's not, that's not the subject. That's another subject. So there was a big, anyway, at the end of the day, uh, that very day, we all stood together. We prayed together with all of them. The next morning, we started teaching again. Now, I, want, I say that because you can go somewhere and learn how to deal with things. And this beautiful this expression right now of what this, this, uh, this, other, this generation is talking, that's what we're talking about. Listen to God, to the Lord. What is he saying? How is he saying it? What's he doing? So you failed. God is bigger than failure. God is bigger than that. Instead of bombing them with everything, every legalistic thing you have, they can't, they can't live with it. It doesn't fly anymore. So I pray that all of us will be Elam people in that sense that we will move by the, and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It, how does God want to respond to this thing? Because he knows what, where they're coming from. And sometimes it, it needs a, 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 a gentle rebuke. And many times it needs a, 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 an, an ear or a shoulder that, that they can hang on to. So I'm going to pray that God will use all of us to understand in a greater way this generation that is coming behind us. And there's another one, and another one, and another one. And, and, and if we list, look at the way things are going, there's a little, a little drifting, a little drifting. Again, I have to come back that if you really want to do it, we have to go back to the root, I told you. We're going to draw from the root. Don't, don't draw from something, your, your experience. Go, go back to the root. That's where the power is. The life is in the root. And lay hold of it. Father, I pray for us at Elam, 
that we will be those that are led by the Spirit. We will not react. We will only respond. And we will not be put off by some of the things we see. We shall love. We shall reach beyond where that person is and go beyond. For we shall touch generation after generation because love has no limits and it is not limited generationally. So I pray in the name of Jesus that we that are here will know what it means to listen to the Spirit of God. We know what the book says, but, but the, 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 that the rule book says, but we want to hear what you want to do. And sometimes it's just to say, I forgive you. Sometimes to say it, it's okay. Help us, Lord, in how we relate to that generation that we are not guilty of driving a wedge, that the, that the word and the sense of God that we feel does not go to another generation because we built up a wall. We resist all walls, Father. Let there be a flow of life from one generation to another. And we'll bless you for it as your name is glorified many years until Jesus comes. We will bless you in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.